So what they're doing as it gets cold is they're trying to sunbathe basically, but the sun's popped behind a, a cloud. Oh, listen to all the little noises they make. Very strange calls. <laughs> Incredible funny noises from the starlings. So as we're saying, we have this radio, we talk to all the different game drives and if they find something they'll let us know, if we find something we'll let them know and that makes sure we all can see the best animals possible while we're out here. Finding animals is a team game. Oh and it sounds like Jamie's found one of the big great grey beasts that we get out here. This is quite a sight, not something that we often see. We've got a hippo out of water in the middle of the day. Now usually these enormous animals are going to spend their day sleeping in the middle of the dam and only head out when night falls and it gets dark. But on a cool afternoon like this afternoon and especially in winter, where they have to travel vast distances in order to get enough food, they could well be wandering out of water, and that's what this enormous creature is doing. He is two tons in weight, so 4,000 pounds, and absolutely enormous. This looks like it's a big ball. And I'm keeping a very close eye on what he's doing. He's not comfortable with us. I think he's going to take the option of running away. But we're just going to stay very, very ready in case he decides he wants to come and investigate. He's limping. He's been injured in some way. And and a very sad situation at the moment is that we are in the middle of the worst drought in the last hundred or so years. And what that means for these enormous animals is that it's getting harder and harder for them to find a safe place to spend the day in a big dam. A hippo has incredibly sensitive skin, which means they get sunburnt, and they get sunburnt even easier than we do. What they do is they secrete a red liquid that acts like a sunblock and flows over their skin if they are stuck in the sun. But rather than that, they'd rather avoid the sun and stay sheltered in the water, in the, in the big watering holes of this area and in the rivers further south. I'll tell you a strange thing about a hippopotamus even though they look really big and really kind of slow, like they wouldn't be able to run anywhere, they are in fact very, very fast. What I mean by that is look at one side of the room, now look at the other, and a hippo, now blink. Blink, close your eyes and open your eyes. Uh, in that time that it took you to go open, close, open, a hippo can run from one side of the room to the other. Uh, how many of you think you can run really, really fast? Okay, hands up if you think you can run fast. Promise you, a hippo is faster than any of us. Even Usain Bolt, at his fastest, would not be able to outrun a hippo running at full speed. So they are very, very quick. And I just need to turn this down quickly. Sorry about that. They are very, very quick. And they're also surprisingly nimble. In other words, a hippo could climb up and down the drainage lines without worrying about it. Even though it looks like there's a steep wall, a hippo could walk up and down here quite easily, despite the fact that they have short little legs. Now, hippos are quite grumpy animals, and especially at this time of year when they don't have very much in the way of food. A hippo only eats grass. Tristan, you were wondering whether or not a, the hippo have enough food to get through the dry season. I hope so, Tristan. 
I think most of them will be okay. Um, but the buffalo, the zebra, the hippos, all of the animals that eat mainly just grass, they don't even eat leaves, they're going to really, really struggle in terms of getting enough food. He's come behind us, Dave. I've just been listening up to where he's going, making sure I keep an eye on him. Sneaky, sneaky. I see you, big boy. Okay, he's quite calmly feeding. We're fine. Oh, I don't want to play games with him. If he wants us to go, then we will go very, very quickly. He's much bigger and weighs much more than the car does. But at the moment, he's perfectly relaxed. He's feeding. Now, what I want to do is I want to get onto the Game Drive channel and I want to warn the other guides that he is here. The reason I do that is because I said that hippos are really fast. They also can be quite grumpy, especially this poor guy. Just imagine, he's hungry, he doesn't have anywhere to hide in the water, he feels scared, doesn't feel safe. And that makes him quite dangerous to anybody walking about here on foot. So what I want to do is just get onto the Game Drive channel and let them know. Going behind that big termite line. I'm hoping he comes out into the open again. Wow! Okay, I'll try to get up ahead. Find a spot where I think we're going to get a, a window. So he should pop out about there. We can just see him. There he comes. I'm even going to pick up my camera for this. It's not every day you get to see an elephant with tusks like this. What a beautiful, beautiful animal. We're going to just keep trying to keep up with them. Mrs. Ski would like to know, can their tusks ever get too long? Uh, when they get very old, I've only ever seen one in my life. But when he got really old, his tusks got really heavy. And he actually used to leave a track in the sand where he used to drag them. But normally, sometimes as they get towards their end of, end of, end of their, their life, those big tusks can become a hindrance. Um, I've actually even seen one in the rainforest in Gabon, sleeping by putting his tusks into the sand, so using them as a rest. But it is very unusual, and there are very few tuskers that size left in Africa. Fortunately, I think he's going to go down into that river system. So the whole class at Parkway would like to know, does it impede their eating? Uh, it can, but what it does do is it improves their fighting. So it gives them access to the best females. And generally, to ha carry ivory of that size, you have to be a massive animal. Now, a big male elephant weighs about six tons, 6,000 kilograms. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get another view of him, but I think I know where he's going. So I'm going to go have a quick look for the leopard, and then I'm going to give him a bit of time, and I'm going to loop around to the top of the hill where I think he might pop out. Now, oh, that's just so exciting. It's not every day. You guys are really lucky you got to see a tusker of that size on your drive and you've seen lions. Uh, so, wow, aren't you guys lucky? And keep the questions coming before the end of the drive, guys. We, we look forward to, we love having questions from you. Now, as it gets drier and drier, uh, we're going to see a lot more elephants in this area because there's permanent water here and there's not a lot of water in to the west 
uh, and to the sorry to the east and to the the north of us. So we're going to get this influx of elephants. They're already the most elephants I've ever seen in the Sabi Sands has been this year. Ah, oh, but now we have an animal we haven't seen yet, and sometimes they look a little bit silly. And it's not the impala next to the road there. It is a wildly beast or a gnu, a wildebeest, and it looks like a big male wildebeest. There he is there. Hello, new. Come collect it. We wouldn't touch it ourselves. But Parkway, um, really great to have Parkway Elementary on board with us, this Sunset Safari, and you lucky fish, you guys. Lions and the biggest elephant we've seen this whole year here on Safari Live. So Parkway, thanks for joining us. Don't forget, you can watch us when you're not at school as well. I ask your teacher how to do that. Uh, but for now, we'll say toodles, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. And uh, welcome back to everyone else. Uh, uh, always great to have the schools along, spreading the word of conservation uh, through the youth. And now we're going to continue looking for the Queen Karula, who is literally giving us the biggest runaround at the moment. I know Taxon and Hubert are also in that area looking for her, but she is proving to be as elusive as usual. But wasn't that incredible? I don't know if you guys were there. How massive was that ivory? It was so beautiful. Uh, I'm definitely hoping we're going to catch up with him again a little bit later. We're going to do a loop through here, have a quick look for Karula. Then I'm going to head up to the junction of Rebecca's and Zoe's road. Hello, Nelson. For twice in one day, aren't we lucky? He is looking a little bit worse for wear. Lots of ticks there, you can see the blind eye. Shame. Not looking too good, old Nelson. Lots of ticks around his neck and he is looking a little bit skinny. But we know old Nelson, he's a survivor. Prove us all wrong and last the dry season. Okay, so I'm gonna keep checking. So Karuna's last direction from where she was spotted was northwest, and that's where we are now. Although none of us have seen any tracks yet. Uh, but as I said, I really want to get another view of that gorgeous elephant bull. So I'm going to do a quick loop through here, checking to see if there's any Karuna tracks. We do have Hubert and Taxon looking in that area to the, to the southeast of us. And I think we should just sneak up and get onto Zoe's road and see if we can catch that big bull coming up the hill. Unless, of course, Kula's, the Queen of Juma has got different plans for us and decides to step out of the road in front of us. Which she has done to me in this very spot. Strangely enough, this area was the first place I ever saw Kula when I joined Fire Live, and this corner was where Jandre and I first saw the cubs after she brought them back from the south. So, this is Karula country we're driving through at the moment. So we're going to scoot on ahead to try and catch that big Ellie ball. Uh, and Jamie's got one of those gorgeous African sunsets to show you. We are going to head through to the hyena den. But before we do, we just had to show you this incredible sky. And I think let's just enjoy this moment in silence for a little bit.
absolutely stunning. And the clouds this afternoon are lined in gold. The sun peeking out from below the clouds like a kind of reverse sunset. Beautiful. But what the setting sun means is that we are running out of time to get to the hyena den and spend a bit of time with them. I think we'd better think about moving. In South Africa, we don't do clouds with silver linings, we do clouds with gold linings. Right, I think it's time for us to start up and move on. Just listening to Brent chat on the Game Drive channel about his incredible elephant bull that apparently he has seen. Now, of course, I don't get to see what he's seeing, so I'm really looking forward to scrolling through some of your screenshots a bit later. Let's head out and go on towards the hyena den. See if we can't find the hyenas. Hopefully they have decided to pop out of their den and they're playing nicely for us this evening. It's been a while since we've had a proper hyena den sighting. Just an update on those Nkuhumas while we were with them earlier, for those of you who were watching. The one female that is closest to us is pregnant. I'm almost certain of it and I confirmed it with Ryan's tracker while we were just sitting there in that sighting. She is most definitely pregnant, so Amber Eyes might be. We discussed that possibility this morning. Margaret was asking about it, and I said that she might be, but it's still quite early stages, maybe about a month, maybe even just a month and a half, the stage that she is at. But that other female is, the way that she was rolling, her belly was kind of like she was shifting around a little bit, not uncomfortable, but almost as though there were babies moving and making her roll around to try and find a more comfortable position. And that combined with the fact that her nipples are somewhat swollen, just a little bit, makes me think that she is indeed pregnant and that we can be expecting more little bundles of Nkuhuma fluffy lion cub joy. James, of course, has taken the somewhat controversial position that a baby lion and lion cub is the cutest baby animal out here uh, it's up to you to form your opinion and you'll be getting to see them in the future fingers crossed I disagree I think baby lions are absolutely adorable and I'm sorry a baby rhino is hands down the cutest little animal out here they've got these enormous feet that are just far too big for their bodies like little puppies and these enormous ears and they kind of flap around <laughs> and dance and play and squeal and really they just don't get cuter than that. All right, to the hyena den with us. All the while keeping an eye out for our African wildcat that we saw here a couple of days ago. I must confess though, if I hadn't seen that African wildcat in the dark, 
the spotlight and the reflection of its eyes. So we've come up to the top of the hill here and we're looking for that big elephant bull. And he was heading in this general direction. No sign. He might be a little bit further to the south. So we might loop a little bit back to where once we've come. Also, this is a great spot to sit and listen for alarm calls. So we've got this nice depression here. So if there's impala alarming, even if they're quite far away, we're going to hear it from up here. And it is, to be honest, one of my favorite spots to just sit on Juma. I mean, just look at that. To quote Hemingway, miles and miles of beep, Africa. And it's amazing if we have a look at how the bush has changed as we head deeper into the dry season. Now, that is very unusual to see a big cumulus cloud anviling at this time of the year. You can see there's definite rain underneath. Uh, it has moved further to the north of us. So I think we are out of danger of getting wet. But I think we're going to come up here. I come up here probably three, four times a week. And I love watching how the bush changes. And it's still mostly green at the moment. But I think in about three weeks' time, we're just going to have those bursts of orange from the bush willows that have changed. And you'll see the evergreens, even in the depth of winter, where there's barely a leaf anywhere. It's the sort of bright green shining through. But no sign of that elephant. He might be a bit further to the south. So, hi, Roy. Roy would like to know how cold is cold? How cold does it get at night here in the Sabi Sands? Uh, Roy, the coldest I've ever experienced. Uh, in the Sabi Sands is probably about minus one, but that is abnormal. I've only ever seen frost here once. Normally, we probably yeah, drop at the moment to a minimum of about 10, 11 degrees Celsius. Uh, as we get June, July, it'd probably go a little bit lower, maybe seven, eight, four on a really cold morning. But it can drop below zero, but it's, it's incredibly rare. Uh, zero, so that's 30 Fahrenheit. Uh, not zero Fahrenheit. If it was zero Fahrenheit, I would be a popsicle because I'm not a fan of the cold. Uh, I think the most uncomfortable I've ever been in my life was in Chicago in a snowstorm. We went to like minus 20 Celsius. We couldn't even open the door. There was so much snow outside. Now, I'm really hoping to get another sneak preview of that big Ellie ball. Definitely working with quite a bit of purpose, so he might be on the trail of a breeding herd. And he could we could see that he was in full must. For those of you who might not be not sure what must is, must is a heightened hormonal state that elephant bulls get into when they want to mate. And elephants are quite unusual. Normally female elephants uh, all female animals will come into heat and then the males are just ready to mate all the time. But with elephants, the males have to be in must and the females have to be in heat or estrus uh, for them to, to mate, which is quite unusual in the animal kingdom. But now speaking of uh, another animal that's got unusual sexual orientation, let's go across to Jamie and one of her favorite creatures. <laughs> Here's a very one of my favorite no oh let's start that whole sentence again here's one of my favorite cute baby animals as brent was saying we have arrived at the spotted hyena den and they are still incredibly cute even though at about five months old they're no longer the little bundles of brown joy 
that we were watching at the start of the year. Difficult to see here which one this is. I think it might be November. They've got a little bit difficult to tell the difference between the various cubs at this point. The age and size difference no longer that clear. No, I think that's one of the Decembers. Oh, dashing about. What's caught their attention? It looks like that's Madam hidden behind the bush there along with her twins in January 1 and 2. They were busy suckling. Oh, don't push your luck with her. That would be a very silly idea. Definitely don't want to antagonize the female that is the matriarch of this clan. She regularly reminds both the cubs and the adults of her position in this group. Shame. Little cubs actually quite hungry. But unfortunately for the third cub on the left that's trying to push its way in, that is absolutely not going to happen. Unlike lions that allosuckle, in other words they are willing to suckle cubs that are not their own, spotted hyenas absolutely will not do that. There you go, you can see, just reminding that cub that it is not welcome in terms of feeding with her cubs. As to where this little one's mother is, is a mystery, probably out resting somewhere. I noticed yesterday when we paid a quick visit to the hyena den, the adults were looking quite hungry. They hadn't eaten in a while. They weren't sporting those bas uh, beach ball-like stomachs that they occasionally do after a big meal. Madam has returned to feed her cubs. They'll be looking for any potential me meal to go and scavenge from. Obviously they haven't had any luck recently. The hyenas are not fussy in terms of their diet. And Oki, you were wondering if hyenas will get sick from things that make dogs ill. And the answer is generally no. But I, I, I do see where you're going with this. Let's go first to the strength of a hyena's digestive system and then we'll get to the more toxic things in a moment. A hyena has absolutely no problem in consuming a carcass that could be days and days old. It can be green, slimy and crawling with maggots and a hyena will be more than capable of dealing with it. They've got the most phenomenal immune systems. They've also got stomach acid that is some of the lowest pH of any stomach acid of any, ma any mammal. And what that means is pretty much everything is dissolved by the power of that stomach. It's one of the reasons why they can consume bones and when you look through a hyena's scat you'll find that there's no big chunks of anything. There's white powdery bone from the calcium in their diet. There's no hair, there's no fibers, they very seldom find pieces of hoof It's because pretty much everything has been dissolved in that incredibly potent digestive system. But to take that a bit further in comparison to pet dogs, as those of you with canine friends or children will know, they cannot eat certain things such as chocolate, for example. There's certain types of fruit, certain types of vegetables. Um, apparently avocado can be very toxic to them. Um, grapes are also quite bad for them. All those things that are on the list of no-nos in terms of what you can feed your dog. And okay, I was thinking maybe that is what you were referring to when you were asking about that. The truth is I don't know. As you know, hyenas are not dogs. They don't fall into the dog family at all. And I'm inclined to think that those digestive systems are quite capable of dealing with such things. But then again, it's not within their natural foodstuffs and it's, they're highly unlikely to come into contact with it unless they've managed to scavenge a, through a dustbin somewhere. Oh, and we're going to talk about those wounds on her in a moment. 
But just to finish off with Oakley's question, the answer is I don't know. I don't think it would be very good for them. But as wild animals, they do show an incredible resilience to all kinds of things. But they're, since they're not dogs, I don't know exactly how their digestive system would respond to that. Not dogs and not cats, something completely different. Well, let's just have a look at Madam's shoulder here because it's the first time we've been able to have a closer look at those injuries. We knew that she had a couple of bite wounds around her shoulders, but we didn't really get an opportunity to have a closer look. Puncture wounds like that, almost certainly teeth. That kind of position. I put forward the theory that they might have been, because it's not just Madam that's injured, Pretty and Corky are both sporting bite marks as well. Now as the highest ranking members of this clan, as far as we know, that's unlikely to have been from other hyenas, might be from each other during a feeding frenzy, but again, not entirely sure. The hierarchy of hyenas is relatively well established in terms of their feeding order. So Madam would get to go first and then Corky and then Pretty or Corky and Pretty at the same time. I don't know exactly where they fall in terms of their hierarchy. I suggested it could have been in conflict with other, another hyena clan. Maybe the hyena clan of Elephant Plains and Arethusa that we got to see properly for the first time eating that baby hippo carcass at the Arethusa Dam. That is pure conjecture on my part. It could have been conflict with lions. Although, to be honest, if a lion is close enough to get hold of a hyena like that, there's a good chance it, could have, it would have killed them. Unless maybe all three of them were together in a way that would outnumber the lions. Could also have been wild dogs, of course. But again, wild dogs tend to go for the backside of the animal. And the fact that something got close enough to Madame's fearsome jaws to bite her on the back of the neck suggests great courage because you really don't want to be that close to a hyena's bone-crushing jaws. Now Madame is named Madame because she is the head of this clan, she is the queen of this clan. But we do have a question through from one of the viewers as to whether or not a male could ever be the head of a hyena clan. Well, Neil, no, never. It's the fascinating thing. It is the unique thing about spotted hyenas. You do not find it in any of the other mammalian families here. Even elephants, where a female is the head of the herd, they are still dominated by any of the bulls that decided to come and join the herd for a while. Spotted hyenas, every, even the highest ranking male will be lower than the lowest ranking female once, he is, once he's reached the adult stage. All male hyenas are submissive to females. Females have exceptionally high levels of androgen and testosterone in their bodies, which makes them bigger, stronger, weightier than the males. It also gives them pseudo-male genitalia, which really confuses matters. It's a completely bizarre evolutionary trait that the female's urinary tract as well as their vagina are fused, which means that they urinate at mate birth through exactly the same passage. Something peculiar to spotted hyenas, in other words, unique to spot. And we're going to discuss a bit more about that. I just need to answer to Mike, who's been calling me on the Game Drive channel. Go ahead, Mike. Good afternoon, Mike. Yes, I've just arrived. It is active. Um, there's one more fuzzy and three more pimpons out. <laughs> Mike, we can put two vehicles in here. I'm sure you can come and join me, which depends on your position. Copy that, make your way. Well, that's an interesting new side effect to our interaction of various technologies. <laughs> we, 
We're watching November, the male cub. I'll explain to you what I mean in a moment. We're looking at November, and to finish off with Neil's question, as far uh, to, uh, it might not be November, sorry. If it were November, it would be a male cub of a high-ranking female. Which is an interesting position to be in, because whilst it is a, sort of a cub, under the protection of the female, and therefore inherits her status, but still will have to be submissive to all of the females. But a higher ranking male, in other words, born to a high ranking female, might have the opportunity of staying on as a clan male and contributing enormously to a hyena clan's life. So just because they are submissive to the females doesn't make them in any way irrelevant in their lives. But male hyenas are responsible for a large percentage of those territorial calls, the typical whoop sound, I don't want to do it too loudly obviously, so I don't want to disturb our little family that's dozing so peacefully here, but those low contact calls, a lot of that is done by clan males and they will be exceptionally active in terms of marking territorial boundaries and regularly used pathways in the form of latrines, as well as in contact calling and occasionally banding together with the rest of the clan to in, in skirmishes involving other clans. They're not irrelevant, it's just that they have to take a largely submissive role. There is no other mammal that shares this trait. Uh, he said that elephant herds are matriarchal, you could almost think of lion prides as being matriarchal as well since a lion pride is a purely female and offspring based society and the males come and go in time but the males are always bigger, always stronger and always dominant to the females. Nobody knows why spotted hyenas evolved to be this way. One of the biggest theories is the big mother theory so the bigger the female, the better they are at producing milk and therefore the longer they can lactate and feed their babies. And Anne, you were wondering about the third cub that came wandering through and whether or not it was old enough to eat meat or if it would still be reliant upon milk. It's a fascinating thing about hyenas. A high-ranking female can lactate for up to a year and a half. They have such an extended period of lactation, usually averages between eight to twelve months that they lactate and feed their young. However, the babies will start to feed on meat between five and six months old. So that little cub that we saw earlier might be nibbling away, supplementing its diet ever so slightly with meat. It is not yet fully independent from its mother. Well, guys, there is another vehicle that is making its way into the sighting. Oh, trouble's just arrived in the form of an older cub. Who we got here? Is this now November? So tricky. Oh, I don't necessarily... Oh, there you go. Look at that submiss submission. Immediate genital presentation to the matriarch. Tail down. Oh, very, very aware of the risk of a bite to the bottom and showing clear submission to the cubs of that hyena as well. I don't need to leave, but I do need to shift around. But we should hopefully be able to get a view from the other side of the bush. Okay, let's go forward a little bit. No, let's remember. All right, let's go forward a little bit. And hopefully, we can still have a view around the other side of the bush. It's important to just make space for other vehicles. Now only two of us will be allowed at this den site at any one time, one point in time. How's your view there Dave? You're good. Here we go. Well, it might mean that our view of the interaction is limited, but I think that the hyenas are relatively relaxed in terms of their behavior at the moment. I don't think they're feeling all that playful. That could well change. It's not as windy as it was, which actually means that the hyena cubs will be a bit bolder 
in their behavior. We spoke yesterday about the fact that the windier it is, the more nervous a hyena cub is around the hyena den. And I'll, one of the big reasons why I absolutely love spotted hyena, apart from the complexities of their society, not just the, the female-driven aspect of it, but actually the complexity of their social interactions as a whole, their hierarchy, the way in which it works, and their success as both predators and scavengers. The thing that really attracts me to hyenas is the intelligence in their expressions and in their eyes, and in fact in their day-to-day -day existence. They are very, very bright animals, and that's been scientifically proven. It's not just through interpreting their facial expressions, which of course would be a ridiculous way of going about things. And they did an experiment with comparing chimpanzees to hyenas, a social experiment, in which a piece of meat was based on a platform, and the only way to get the meat was to pull in opposite directions. So they did this, and it took the chimpanzees a slightly, ever so slightly shorter time to work out the puzzle than it did the spotted hyenas, but both of those different species did very quickly. Then, the kicker was that a, one of the chimpanzees and one of the hyenas was replaced with another individual that had never seen this puzzle before. And within a split second, with only seconds, the one spotted hyena had clearly communicated to the other spotted hyena how to solve that puzzle, how to go about getting the meat down, and they had cooperated together to do that faster than the chimpanzees did. Now they've got an immense amount of problem solving skills and that may well have come from the fact that they evolved at the same time as human beings and they evolved in a way that allowed them to always be on the outskirts of human or human ancestors settlements and dwellings scavenging, taking advantage. Now, up until we worked out what was going on and the dustbins were placed very safely out of their reach every night, the spotted hyenas used to learn to come into camp and they learned that if they tipped over the dustbin and it made a noise that somebody would come and chase them out. Now, what they learned to do was pull the dustbin upright out of the camp and then tip it over once they were out of earshot. How's that for problem solving? In the space of just a couple of nights, they worked out that that was the way forward. <laughs> and Andy and Julia, just on the subject of the strangeness of the genital arrangement of a female hyena, Andy and Julia from Los Angeles were wondering, how does a spotted hyena give birth through the pseudo-penis? which is essentially an extended clitoris? The answer is with difficulty. And in fact, it's not uncommon for a female hyena giving birth to her first cubs to either lose that set of cubs or lose one of those cubs, or in fact die during the, the labor process. It is a bizarre adaption that they have going on that actually can result in the death of younger females. Once the female is a bit older and she has given birth once or twice, it's a bit easier. The shape or the, the passage has been split open to make the passage of the cubs easier. But it is not an easy process for her. And the same goes for the mating process in which the vaginal passage actually inverts to allow for the penetration from the male. Again, not an uncomplicated way of doing things. It's still not known exactly why it is the hyenas have evolved to be that way. Quite bizarre. And yet totally intriguing and fascinating.
Now those injuries on Madam are almost completely superficial. They're not going to do her any harm. Best female in the group, but they generally are set apart from the others by their sheer attitude. And yes, she might well have come barging in to the skirmish, putting herself in harm's way first. And that maybe is a different explanation, but a similar idea as to what it was you were asking. I don't think they targeted her. I think she made herself a target, if that was indeed the case. Just in the same way that when there is a breakdown in discipline and a hyena needs to be shown its place, from what we have observed from her behavior, herself, Corky and Pretty have always been the front runners in those aggressive moments with other high, lower ranking hyenas. Now we're almost getting to the stage where it is a little bit too dark for us at the hyena den. We might have to think about leaving them relatively soon. If you are joining us on our live safari for the first time, just to illuminate you and not the den, haha, -ha, we cannot actually light up the den site. The reason being that the cubs are quite young and it is our policy not to disturb them any more than we need to. And that would include shining lights on these young cubs and it just adds an additional level of distraction particularly at night, since the biggest killer of hyenas, the lions, there's always a chance of them moving around as it gets dark. So while we exit the hyena den and set off in search of other nocturnal creatures, let's find out what Brent is up to. We're back on the hunt for the dominant female leopard of Juma, Queen Karula. And uh, she is proving to be a little difficult. But we have not given up hope. We are the eternal optimists. And this is a favorite area of hers. So I know there are three of us now driving all the little roads in this area, hoping to catch a glimpse of the queen. Any time to pop on all the lights. There we go. Now, the reason I'm putting on my headlights is, is not so I can see where I'm going. It's to see if I can see any of her tracks. It's still a little bit light for the use of a spotlight just yet, but my spotlight will be coming out a little later. Definitely one of the best times of the day. As the sun s sets, there's just a little bit of ambient light around, and it's sort of a trigger for the cats to start moving, start hunting. So there's a good chance we might find her if we do on the move. Thanks, Jamie. I'll be pulling up. Checking every termite mound and checking the road in front of us. One can never give up hope that we're going to find something spectacular around the next corner. And uh, yesterday was proof of that. And we got our first ever pangolin on the live safaris. Now, quite interesting. Now, I'm just listening here now, and if I keep quiet over my shoulder, we can hear some very late cicadas. So normally they are calling. I'm going to see if I can catch one. Just hang on. I'll be back. Okay, 
So I think they sound like redback cicadas, which is very strange because they are normally always January, oh sorry, November through to about February. But it could be because of the lack of rain and this surprise rainy weather we've had now that's caused them to pop out. Now they're going to sit. Oh, you see they went quiet when they heard me. So at least I know where to look for them. They like to sit on the branches. And they are very, very camouflaged. They sit flush on the branches. I thought there was one underneath. No, I know nothing flew. So it could be a bit further, maybe on that one. Just keeping a careful look. They're incredible creatures. They're actually very hardy and very, very tough. They're avoiding me. But it's still really interesting that we've got cicadas calling this late in the year. This little bit of late rain and the fact that we've had almost no rain for our, our, our normal wet season could be the reason that they're calling now. But it is like normally in the summer it's a deafening, deafening sound. And literally every tree is filled with cicadas from top to bottom. Now, very interesting, in the, in, the, in the US, your cicadas only make an appearance once every 16 years. So they go underground, they go dormant for 16 years. I find that absolutely fascinating. Out here, owls make noise every year. Keep creeping through this area where we think Karula is. And a lot of the game drive roads are, are in the specific spots they are for a very good reason. Now, more than likely they were old elephant paths originally. And uh, a lot of the big cats like a good road to walk on. No grass in their eyes, although well, there's much grass this year. But particularly in the early mornings to avoid the dew. Bouncy, bouncy. back down towards Twin Dams. Well, Anne would like to know why do we call Karula the Queen? Well, Anne, that started long before I joined Safari Live. Uh, she's called the Queen because uh, she's the dominant female on Juma. And when the live drive started, she's probably the most seen of all the cats. And uh, I think, I'm not sure who gave her the original nickname, the Queen of Juma. Maybe one of our long-time viewers out there can tell me who knows how, or who gave Karula uh, the original name, the Queen of Juma. It'd be very interesting to find out. So if you know, pop me an email, questions at wildearth.tv, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Let me just fix my seat here. Sorry, I'm falling off. There we go. It's like they've driven down this road about five times today in search of her. Fifth time, sixth time, lucky. Nearly time to get the big spotlight out. Not quite yet, but I've got it at the ready. We apologize for Brent disappearing off your screens as suddenly as he did. As most of you know, Wendy's experiencing 
a severe attack of the gremlins, which is the nickname we give to technical difficulties that we experience every now and again out here. And our tech team are furiously working on solving the problem. And never fear, because you've arrived on safe and sound on the back of Rusty. And we're heading out into the night to explore. And as most of you know, it's one of my favorite times of day to be driving out in the bush. There's this building sense of the unknown the mysteries that are going to unfold during the night. And I think one of the big reasons is because the leopards and the lions are more active at this time of day. But for me, most importantly, you get to see all kinds of rare creatures. Things like porcupines, in theory, and servals, and wildcats. And of course, Dave, you do realize that unless you find me a pangolin, this is favoritism. That's how it works. If you, if you don't find me a pangolin, I'm going to take offense. <laughs> well, at least this time you'll know what it is. <laughs> Dave was taken very much by surprise by that pangolin sighting yesterday. However, he did very, very well in terms of picking up on it and spotting it for Brent. So I've decided that since Brent's claimed the rare pangolin sighting, it's my time to now find a caracal. And the lovely ladies in Final Control agree with me. I haven't seen a porcupine yet either. I mean, not that I'm complaining. I'm really, really not. I've been incredibly lucky with sightings in terms of unusual animals. Between the honey badgers with Sam and Brent this morning to our serval from a couple of weeks ago and my African wildcat from about a week ago. I really cannot begin to complain. But you know, I'm not complaining. I'm just just setting the bar quite high and in winter one can do that especially in this drought we're going to see unusual animals scurrying and wandering about at strange times of the day we really saw that bull hippo out of the water earlier and that we're going to be seeing more and more frequently you never know what might decide to come wandering out of the bushes And of course, there's always the lovely bird life of an evening drive. Yesterday, Brent had a relatively rare sighting with a spotted eagle owl. I'm hoping for a verose eagle owl next. I know that Brent's looking for white-faced scops owls, which would be something he's been aiming for for days now, or months, to get on the live safaris. But we all have our different goals. saw the serval somewhere here and of course my brain despite knowing that it is irrational always checks the same place where I've had a particularly interesting sighting for that animal even though I know uh, it's uh, outside of our traverse area just somebody calling in a leopard um, but in Buffels Hook not south sorry north of our traverse area somewhere where we cannot go They've just called in a leopard there. However, it is walking south, which is relatively good news because that's not far from our cut line. Just want to keep listening. Ah, still far away, apparently. I'm not going to make it here before the end of the sunset safari, but you never know could well be there for us to follow on the sunrise safari and I don't know why but something has made my eye absolutely poor I'm sorry please bear with me just trying to dab away at it it's hazy the season out here most of us have been sneezing our way through the drives there's a lot of dust about and even though we've had a little bit of rain it's still incredibly dry, which means that there's even more dust flying about than normal. And of course, even if we can't manage an aardvark or a porcupine or something unusual, we could still see a bush baby, which I would love to get on screen once again. 
They're a little bit lazy in these winter months. It takes them a while to get out and going. Oh, James is wondering, James Richard is wondering, could we not go and check the honey badger burrow? That's a very good idea, James. I think that's a brilliant idea. I wonder whether or not Brent doesn't have that up his sleeve, however. Unfortunately, I have absolutely no idea where the honey badger den burrow may be. I don't know. Brent didn't tell me this afternoon. I'm not sure exactly where he saw them. Dave, were you with Brent this morning? No, you weren't with Chandra. All right, so Dave doesn't know either. So Dave's just going to have to go back to pangolin spotting instead. Or anything else, Dave. I'll settle for anything else. <laughs> Dave accepts that as his challenge for the evening. Of course, each and every person's spotlighting technique is somewhat different. I was mocked by James for my high armed sort of lifting the spotlight right up in order to shine and to look for the different animals. I was mocked to the point that I've actually completely changed my technique now, despite standing by the fact that it is quite a useful one. I've now got my arm right down. But everybody has a different style, but most of us you'll notice are quite erratic in the way in which we shine the spotlight, and that's because we're checking the areas that we feel will yield the best results, whether it be a large maroon tree or an open clearing or a drainage line. We're trying to cover as much ground as possible with the spotlight. And we can afford to move it relatively quickly because the briefest glint of an animal's eye shine in the dark is really very noticeable. It catches your attention immediately like, for example, the fact that there is something hiding right in the middle of where my spotlight is, Dave. And I can't see the eye shine properly. I'm just going to switch off. You see there, there's something. There's definitely an animal. But I can't see what it is. Maybe see it better. What are you? I know there's something there, but I can't tell you what it is. Unless, I can hear elephants, but it's definitely not an elephant. And I've lost it now. Stop looking here. Huh. I have absolutely no idea what that is. I'm going to try and go forward. Dave, I need you to keep, try and zoom in, because now I can't see but I can roughly show you where it was. It was sort of in that bush over there. I'm watching from the monitor. Try and keep my arm still. Everybody keep your eyes peeled. I don't, genuinely don't know what it is and I can't get a good angle at it. Hmm. Well, that might be a mystery forever. I cannot work that out. Oh well. There's something moving about. I really... I... Is, that, is that it down there? Down a bit, Dave? Is there something there? It is. There's something moving, right? Yes, there's something moving. What on earth? It looks like a cat head to me. Those look like cat ears, don't they? I mean, is my imagination? Oh, don't move, Jamie. Sorry, this is really difficult to do because I can't see it. Can you see where I'm shining there? Is that a genet? I think we've got a genet. There's definitely something there. <laughs> And I'm determined to figure out what it is. My arm is about to drop off from this angle that it's at. 
can hear Eddie's coming towards us. Come on. Come on. What have we got here, everybody? Any guesses? What do you... Oh, sorry, sorry. Dip the arm a bit. Oh, oops. I can't move more than a millimetre or the light disappears. You, Dave, do you think you can take over? I'm about to drop the spotlight at the angle that I'm at. There. What is that? Hmm. Dave very kindly has now taken the spotlight. And our mystery animal is there. I've no idea how to figure out what that is. There, it's moving again. Oh, a little bit to the right there. You can see its ears moving. Oh, there we go, movement again. <laughs> what on earth have we got here? I cannot figure this one out. There, it's looking back at us. How, how big are we looking now? Dave, we're very zoomed in, aren't we? Yes. So it's small. All the way in. Okay, so it's something small with cat-like ears. Oh, this is terribly frustrating. What on earth are you? Teresa's convinced that it is a serval. I, I wouldn't be surprised. It's a something. I think it is a... Oh no! Poor animal, it's a taker. <laughs> oh, sorry Dave. Um, we're just going to take the light off it. <laughs> it's a poor taker that has had its head turned all the way around so we couldn't see it we could just see the backs of its ears flapping <laughs> sorry mr dacre <laughs> apparently brent is killing himself laughing at us oh that's devastating i got so excited i think he's a wild cat or something uh, just to let you know because obviously most of you know that we try and avoid shining on diurnal animals like that. But the Dacre did have his tur head turned away, so we won't have damaged his eyesight in any way. He might feel a bit dazzled, but that's why we couldn't see what he was, because he had his head turned away from the light. So sorry, Mr. Dacre. My apologies. He was just looking for a nice sleep spot to go to bed, and I'm never going to hear the end of this now. <laughs> That's so disappointing. Brent's going to tease me all day. And, and you, Dave. Yep. You know you're going to be involved. I'm sorry. And that's not even your fault. But you're going to get dragged into that as well. Ah. Oh. oh, well. Guess it definitely wasn't a serval. Next time. Can't have all the luck all the time. That would just be too easy. Oh, I can smell a big must ball somewhere here. An elephant, that is. In that state known as must, with the high raised levels of testosterone, makes the elephant very, very smelly, very distinctive smell, and I can smell it. Viam describes it as Oros gone off. Oros is a South African, a South African juice concentrate that we, as kids, all of us were given at sports matches. At half time, you went and you had Oros. That was what you had. And Viam thinks that an elephant in must smells like Oros that's been left in the bottom of a cup for a while. Oh, I'm going to go and nurse my embarrassment and slight disappointment. In the meantime, I suppose we should head across to Brent so that he can tell you all what he thinks of that somewhat embarrassing moment. So we are looking for any nocturnal wonder. So 80% of the more interesting small mammals come out at night. Porcupines, 
honey badgers, serval, caracal, genet, civet. So we're looking for all of those. Now this is a particularly good area for those little creatures. I've seen civet and serval and genet and bush baby all in this little stretch. So fingers crossed that one of them is going to be obliging. There's always a chance of a leopard or a hyena or any other creature popping up. Also checking the big dead trees for owls. The last serval I saw was just up ahead there. Oh dear, nothing much out there this evening on um, this open the seep line. Oh, I think I spot a bush baby. A bush baby. The smallest primate we get out here in the African bush. Around on the other side of this tree, there still see eyes. Best is going to be from the other road. It was quite far away. Hopefully, it doesn't move before we get closer. Yeah. Of course, he's got to look at us for him to for us to spot him. We're looking for the shine of his eyes. Yeah, <laughs> he looks like he's disappeared. It's been quite the eventful day. I think Kahuma's trying to catch those buffalo this morning. Uh, unsuccessful. I've just heard they've now moved to Sibambili, so they've moved to the west of where they were this afternoon. Hopefully they are going to come back east early tomorrow morning. We'll definitely be checking for that. While we continue to try to find something fascinating in the last few moments of drive, which we're of course failing dismally at right now, uh, Jandre and I would like to bid you adieu. Thanks for joining us. And don't forget, we're going to be on again in a few short hours for the Sunrise Safari. And everything's going to be brand new. So hopefully lots of tracks and lots of cats. But till then, let's hand you back to Jamie. Well, rain starts to head for home and the evening draws and the darkness draws ever closer. I'm prolonging the inevitable teasing that's going to occur when I get back to camp by continuing to just keep driving. I just keep driving, we don't have to go home. No, I'm joking. It's not like we haven't all made that mistake in the past. And I'm sorry, as I turned to speak to you, 
an eyelash of mine decided to turn itself inside out and is now attempting to crawl into my retina. There we go. I think that's a bit better, sort of. There we go. Much better. Oh, not quite. Dave, I hear you do some fantastic eye work. I when, never need it. <laughs> thank you, Dave. <laughs> You'll all remember, of course, those of you who are watching, the fantastic drive where poor James got flies in his eyes and Dave had to come to his rescue and help him to remove them one particularly memorable afternoon. Dave has since had to help me out in a very similar situation. And I can tell you that he is very good at helping one out in such optical emergencies. Not quite as bad as summer. Remember that dung beetle that we started the show off with? Well, I had one of those ones fly into my face whilst driving at relatively high speed. And as a result, had a full-on black eye. It looked like somebody had actually planted a fist in it. It was just from a dung beetle that had hit me. Also sliced open the side of my eyebrow. It just goes to show, there's some very strange hazards out here. Maybe something that you might not expect. And apparently some of you, of course, were convinced that there was a serval on the back of the Dacre. Well, I thank you for that, that level of, of comfort. It is Gen B, apparently, who suggested there was a serval on top of the Dacre and therefore no embarrassment necessary. Very much appreciated, Gen B. All right, Dave, I suppose we should start heading back south again. <laughs> we should think about it eventually. Prolonging the inevitable. Oh! How truly unfortunate. That is a very badly placed roadblock, elephants. That was definitely ill considered. There's not even any way around it. Ah. I wonder if I can shove it out of the way. I can't. Not with the VR rig. Mm, thank you, Dave. Um, oh, how terribly, terribly unfortunate. All right, I'm going to put my spotlight down for one second so I can navigate around this. And get, get to spend the last moments of your sunset safari watching me do an Austin Powers style maneuver here. Oh. Okay, let's not put the GoPro rig in the spiky tree. You good there, Dave? Yep. Get all limbs out of range. There we go. That looks pretty easy. That was actually relatively painless. Lovely having a little car that one can maneuver. Okay guys, just a quick note, I'm not sure if Brent touched upon it or not, but that from the 1st of June, our Sunrise Safari will be changing times. So our Sunrise Safari will be starting half an hour later. And forgive me because I'm going to read to you what that means in terms of start times in your various time zones. So that's 6.30 Central African time in the morning till 9.30. What that means is half past 12 at night to 3.30 in the morning Eastern Time and half past 9 at night to half past midnight Pacific Time. And the details will also be on our Safari Live Facebook page for those of you who didn't manage to scribble down those time changes in time. Well, all that means is that we are half an hour later in the mornings. Our sunset safari will stay exactly the same. So it's just so that we can follow the times of the sunrises and the sunsets. And as you can see, darkness has fallen. It's time for Dave and myself. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I don't know where that came from. Time for Dave and myself to head for home. <coughs> I think I swallowed a bug. <coughs> 
thank you to Dave for all of his fantastic camera work as well as to Rebecca and to Noon in Final Control. And most importantly, thank you to you all for your questions, comments and joining us on the back of our safari vehicle. We'll catch you in just a few hours, but in the meantime, have a wonderful day or evening wherever you are. Alright, and hopefully by tomorrow morning my lungs will be functioning. Bye-bye. <laughs>